Hey, what's going on, guys? So today we have the awesome privilege to speak with Associate Professor of Wind Studies at the University of North Texas, Dr. Andrew Traxel. And we discuss some really, really cool topics of conducting and the art of conducting and rehearsal and in the midst of performance and all of these great, great opportunities for not only musicians but conductors to uh, work on their craft and hone in on these awesome techniques and strategies to get better and cool opportunities that are out in the field right now, even in the midst of COVID-19. So stay tuned and listen to this awesome, awesome discussion on the art of conducting and some really, really cool opportunities that all conductors, young, old, in between, whatever it may be, and how you can uh, get better not only as a conductor but as a musician in this awesome profession that we all love. Hello, and welcome to Music Ed All In, the podcast for music education majors and young music education professionals. Coming at you from Northeastern Ohio, I'm your host, Kevin Neese. It's time to go all in. What is going on, everybody? Thank you so much for tuning in to episode four. I'm super excited to have a great mentor, teacher, and guest with us today. Today we have Dr. Andrew Traxel, Associate uh, Director of Wind Studies at the University of North Texas. And I'm thrilled to have him on the show as our second guest for Music Ed All In. Dr. Traxel, thank you so much for uh, joining us today. Thanks, Kevin. It's great I to be here. Greatly appreciate having you here. And I'm super excited and I think our listeners are going to be really eager to hear all of the great stuff that you're doing, not only with Lone Star Winds, but at North Texas. And I think our topic of conducting is going to be a fun topic for all. Um, so Dr. Traxel, you have been in the conducting game <laughs> for a long time now. And I mean, you've had experience all across the board. What were things that got you interested primarily in conducting after you did like music at it, Drake? Sure. Well, um, it, it kind of happened near the end of my time as an undergraduate student at Drake University. I, my, my intention when I went to college was to, uh, was, was, it was going to be to teach public school music. And um, at, when I first started school, I wasn't sure whether it was going to be uh, vocal uh, music education or instrumental music education because I, I sang and I played. And um, so when I, when I first enrolled, I was sort of torn between which, which path to choose. I eventually uh, decided to go with instrumental music education. Um, and I was really, I think one of the, my main ins into that world was through jazz. I was, I was really into jazz. Uh, in the state of Iowa where I grew up, jazz is actually, I mean, this, this, for somebody from the outside, this seems strange, but jazz is really popular in, in music education in Iowa. And in fact, almost every school uh, high school, at least in Iowa, has a jazz program. Um, there's about, there's 400 plus high schools in Iowa, and they all have jazz programs and sometimes multiple jazz ensembles. And it's a really big part of the curriculum uh, for a lot, a lot of, a lot of reasons and a lot of, a lot of really great people who, who set that up that I, I won't go into detail about. But I was really into jazz and my, my, uh, my music educators were really in, into, um, into, into teaching jazz and I had great experiences through that. So that was my in to music education, and that's kind of what my intention was, was to be um, a well-rounded band director, but, but jazz was my passion, and that's kind of what I wanted to, uh, to, to excel in. But, um, but what ended up happening is, I, as I got near the end of my undergraduate education, I realized that uh, I was in a conducting class, the only one that was offered or required uh, in my undergrad. And I was getting towards the end of that in the, the fall of my junior year, like, like most people take uh, the location that most people take conducting class right. in, in their undergraduates. And um, I realized that I, that the majority of my time was going to be spent as a, as a public school teacher. Um, the, 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 the greatest opportunity and the majority of the opportunity I was going to have to teach my students was going to be on the podium as a, as a concert band conductor. And I realized that, I didn't, I, for me personally, I didn't feel like 
I was ready. I didn't feel like I, I, I had enough skill yet to be successful, considering that that was going to be how I had an opportunity to interact with uh, and have an impact on most of my students. Uh, we'd I, I, I'm sure I would have a jazz ensemble where I was teaching, but that was only going to serve uh, at most 20% of the population in, in the band program. So I realized that I, if I was going to be effective um, and I had a desire to be well-rounded, that I needed to study conducting more. So because my undergraduate only had one semester required at the time, uh, or even offered for instrumental music edu education students, I, I sort of worked with my, my mentor there, uh, Bob Minier, who's the director of bands at Drake. And uh, we, we, we set up this um, independent study course on conducting. And again, just for more pragmatic purposes than anything else, I just wanted to be, get better at the mode that I was going to be teaching in. And it was, it was that study, I think, that really sort of lit the spark in me. Uh, it, it was that, that, that semester also happened to be uh, the semester that we played Lincoln Trapozzi in, right. uh, in, a, in, uh, in a concert and a, and a tour. And um, I had a light bulb moment in the middle of the piece, the fifth movement, Lord Melbourne. Uh, it just, it hit me. I mean, really hit me. I, I can, I can go back. I can see right now. I, if I look off in the middle of distance. I can see that moment when it, it, I, the whole world sort of opened up to me and I realized uh, that, that being a conductor was something that I really wanted to pursue, but it was still within the context of, uh, of music, of, of teaching um, public school, high school, middle school. Um, and that was, so I, I didn't really think about becoming a, a collegiate conductor until another year or two down the road. Um, and I, I can, that's another whole story in itself and another light bulb moment. But, but really, that's kind of how I got started studying conducting was it was really more of a pragmatic thing. Well, the thing out of, you know, all of that's so cool. And I'm so blown away that jazz was such a high priority in the state of Iowa. Mm -hmm. I, I think that's so cool because I feel like in most, uh, I'd say a majority of music ed programs just around the country, jazz is kind of, I don't want to say it's the afterthought, but it, I'd say it's the one that kind of gets neglected in the band world because you, you got marching band, you know, that's how you're getting out in the community. You have your concerts for, uh, you know, your, your holiday concerts, you have your spring festival or large group contest and, and jazz kind of gets tossed into that mix. Right. And you had such a great, you know, foundation of it. That's really cool. And uh, you had mentioned Bob Minier. I remember you hosted, I believe it was it moving, moving with meaning. Is that That's right? Yeah. Yeah. And I was, I, I was a sophomore in undergrad and you had Bob Minier come and I was going into the school of music and I saw this gentleman and it was kind of long in the distance and he was just kind of moving his arms outside, like in the grass greenery area behind one one I was like, what is that? What's that guy doing? <laughs> and I got, as I got closer, I was like, oh, he must be with Dr. Traxel and they're doing the clinic together. Cause I hadn't met him at that point. Um, but you said, uh, Bob was a, you know, a great influence on you and you studied privately with him. Right. Um, with that, you said it started to influence you more in your route of public ed to pursue conducting um, further at UNT and, you know, kind of take you along that path. What, um, what were things that you caught yourself doing, you know, maybe studying in your master's program that you were like, oh, wow, I didn't realize I did that as a conductor. What were things that you were like, oh, I didn't realize I did that as much as a conductor. Does that make sense? Maybe some weird sure. ticks as a conductor or something like that? Yeah, um, I, th I think uh, the, the, the self-realization in, in the study of a conductor uh, uh, by the conductor who's studying is, is more, it's, it's, it, there's definitely the things that you, you don't realize that you were doing that maybe aren't as effective as they could be. Right. Um, I, th I think for, for me and for a lot of my students, it becomes more about, what, uh, how much am I not doing? And I, do, and I don't mean to say that we should, uh, that, that all, all of us should endeavor to overconduct or to, or to conduct way more than is needed. But I think it's kind of like, I, I always uh, refer to this analogy. It's like when you, when you record yourself for the first time playing or the first 10 or 100 times playing, and uh, you, know, you watch students do this, they record themselves. They've been, they've been practicing by themselves for a long time 
and they, they've heard themselves simultaneously with their playing or, right. or now, now we use the term synchronously. We're, we're getting used to that <laughs> yeah. with all of our online teaching. Um, and it's kind of, once they hear themselves, they record themselves and listen back, they go, that, that, you know, that's terrible. Or the, or the first time you hear your voice when you're, you know, you record yourself talking or something, you go, that's terrible. That, that's not what I sound like. And to a certain degree, we, you know, we do hear ourselves differently internally. But I think also what we're surprised about is, well, I thought I crescendoed a lot more there. Or I, I thought I, I thought I uh, took that, that Richard Ando much more dramatically and I slowed down a lot more. That was my perception when I was playing it. But when I go back and listen to it, I realize it wasn't that, it wasn't that much. I think the same thing happens when we, um, when we watch ourselves conduct or when, or when someone watches us conduct and then they give us that kind of feedback and we think, well, I was really trying to slow down there or I was really trying to show the, the weight of the sound uh, or the lightness of the sound or the staccato or the legato. And, um, and once we get, we get feedback or we watch ourselves from recording, we realize that, okay, well, it might've felt personally like we were doing enough but um, the ultimate uh, barometer is if the ensemble, the players in the ensemble can understand it and do something with that, then we know that it's made an impact. Now, what oftentimes happens is we go the, is, is, is the other, other way is also possible. And that's where we do too much, where we do so much that there's so much information sort of flying from the podium that um, just your your everyday, uh, your average, your normal, or your even your advanced uh, students, players, uh, it's so much information, they can't possibly po process it all and do anything with it. And then it, you kind of end right. up canceling yourself out that way too. But for me, I know it's a lot, for a lot of my students, it's more about um, how, how much more you can do with the material in the music and the material in your conducting technique to um, sort of make an impact. Right. And that's like a perfect segue because I, this whole talk inspired me because I was watching one of my favorite movies, Glory Road, which is actually based off of a Texas school. That's um, right. Yeah. Texas Western at the time, but now it's UTEP uh, El Paso. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, coach Haskins goes in and he's working with one of these recruited players. And he's like, the kid's trying to cross him up, go for a layup or something. And he's not succeeding at all. And coach Haskins is like, what are you doing? He's like, you're just doing all this movement without any accomplishment. And this mm. huge light bulb went off in my head. And I was like, every, I feel like so many conductors do need to hear that all of this extra, all of these gestures that in your head might seem like, Oh, you know, I'm really trying to highlight and show the music, but is it, am I getting anywhere with it? Am I making any headway? Am I moving any ground with it? And I I've seen over the years, you know, in, in my very, very short time, <laughs> but uh, I would see uh, maybe a director rehearse his or her ensemble. And I'm like, wow, that was very, very good. And I really enjoyed it. And then it got to the performance and I saw very, very different things happening. And mm -hmm. I didn't, I, I was, I wondered what the thought process was behind it. Maybe they heard it in the moment of the piece and they felt like they had to give more or maybe they felt like, oh, I'm not giving enough here. I, I just th I think that's interesting how people process the information differently. Well, I think, I think you make a really good point. The, one of the last things you said was about being in the moment. Right. And I, and I think, um, I think that's where, that's where it, it, it's one of the most difficult things I think to learn as a conductor. And it's one of the things that especially young conductors struggle with a lot is, um, you know, we're worrying so much about our technique you know, am I, am I, am I moving in a, in a, in a horizontal line the way that I want to, to show that legato? Uh, am I, am I cueing in the right direction? What's the shape of my left hand as I cue? You know, am I, am I mirroring too much? We think we get so much inside of our head about the technique that um, it, it kind of shuts down our ears. So I know, I know early on as a, right. as a young conductor, and I, I mean, even still today, I have to kind of remind myself or ask myself at least, am I actually hearing what's going on? You know, but in the early days, of course, I really felt like my ears were shut down. I, I, I'd be thinking so much about how, how I was moving and almost hearing what I was, how I was moving more than hearing the actual sound that was coming back at me. Exactly. And, and that's, that's, you know, it's a real hard thing. The, 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 the thing that I can tell you uh, from experience as, as a conductor and as a teacher of conducting is that that tends to get better. It, it, your ears open up 
uh, and you, you uh, are able to process the sound that's coming at you, the more comfortable you get with yourself. It's just like uh, on your instrument, it's your learning muscle memory and you're learning how things feel and, and, and sound simultaneously. It's almost like a feel slash sound simultaneity that you eventually get used to. Uh, okay, I don't have to think about how to connect a 4-4 pattern anymore. I don't have to think about how to connect a legato 4-4 pattern in a half note quarter quarter rhythm uh, played on the lower tessitura of the trumpet at a soft dynamic. I, you know, I can process all those things at, at the same time um, through you know, a, a period of practice that I don't have to think about how I move to make that happen. So I can just focus on what's the sound that's coming back at me. Is it, is it what I want? Is it my ideal? And if it's not, can I, can I do something to change it or to influence change? Um, and so, so that's, that's one thing, you know, sort of hearing on the podium uh, what's actually happening. And then the other thing is, is remaining in the moment. And I, and I would say that uh, rehearsal and perform, you talk about sort of a difference between maybe what you saw in rehearsal and what you saw in performance. Sure. And I guess, um, and that's, that's certainly true. Um, I guess one of the differences is kind of as a performer also, uh, I know as a conductor, I think about, okay, well, um, band X, whatever band I'm working with, okay, they, here's how, how they sound before the performance. Like here's the final rehearsal before the performance, whether it's in the, the rehearsal, the regular rehearsal period or it's a dress rehearsal. Um, maybe it's not even in the concert hall and you're, you're sort of approaching the, the performance and you're thinking, man, I don't know if we're ready yet, but then you also kind of think in the back of your head, but I bet something that they're going to turn it on for the performance. Like there's, 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 there's going to be something else magical in the air. Part of it's, you know, wearing whatever you wear for concerts. Uh, part of it's, there's an audience. Part of it's just like, it, this is the, the exam, you know, like, okay, now I really have to focus and something changes. Now for some people that, that equates into getting nervous and, 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 and having performance issues. And that's, that's one thing for others. It's just like, all of a sudden you take everything that you can do and it sort of is, becomes augmented because you, you sort of recognize the moment that you have to step up into. So the same for a conductor is that if, if you're listening and you're responding to what's going on, you are, you're analyzing uh, and responding to the sound that's happening, which is maybe different than it was in the afternoon at the dress rehearsal. I mean, there's so many elements that are different. There's, there's bodies in the audience, like living bodies, bodies in the audience <laughs> you know, listening. There's, uh, the air is different, uh, may, maybe literally, or maybe just figuratively, you know, is the air thicker? Is, is it more tense? Is it just thicker because the air conditioning died and humidity started rolling into the into the into the the hall? You know, there's so many different factors that that sort of change the air, uh, literally and figuratively. So, as a conductor, you you want to be able to be aware of just being in the moment and responding to the moment, because as as we all know, is every single time we play our ensembles play, no matter how many members we have in the ensemble, if we have 60 or we have 120 uh, or anywhere in between higher or lower, um, there's that many degrees of variables that change for every single time that we play a particular piece or a passage uh, just because everybody's unique and everybody's different. Everybody is poten has potential for doing something different each time. So if we're not in the moment in rehearsal and in performance, we don't have the opportunity to really uh, make an impact on, on what's happening and then therefore help our students grow. So um, being, I, I, I kind of call it plugged in. A lot of times I'll tell the players like, you know, you got to plug in here. You got, you got to be in the moment and respond to each other, respond to me, but respond to each other more importantly. And uh, as, as a conductor, we have to do that too. Oh, I think that's, uh, it's, it's great insight. And, has there been a conductor? I know you're a fan of Carlos Cliver. Um, mm -hmm. I think out of any orchestral conductor I've ever seen, I think he is a great in the moment conductor. Um, for our listeners, if you have ever had the opportunity to watch the TED Talk, I think it's uh, Itai Talgrim, mm -hmm. uh, Israeli uh, conductor of the Israeli Philharmonic. Um, he dissects all of these different conductors and he talks about Carlos Cliver. And there's a moment where, um, he's really in the moment and he's listening. He's just really enjoying it. And it gets, you know, high energy, but then a trumpet player does something 
that he doesn't like. And he instantly like locks eyes with this dude <laughs> and shows right. him exactly what he wants and how, um, how that's not the, the desired sound. And I think that, <laughs> I think it takes the trumpet player, typical trumpet player, as I say it, um, <laughs> takes him like two or three times to get it. <laughs> and then by the third time, Cliver's like, okay, that was good. And I'll, I'll go back to what I was doing. <laughs> right. But is there any other, you know, maybe in wind band or orchestral choral for that matter, even that you've seen really great in the moment, anybody that you've, uh, you know, been inspired by? Yeah. Well, I, um, that it, it, Carlos, yeah, absolutely. Carlos Cliver, I mean, is like, <laughs> that's a terrible heart, but that's the heart. heart. <laughs> yeah. I mean, he's just really, uh, so amazing to watch. And, right. um, he luckily in this in this day and age uh it, it used to be that you know you, there, there was really hard to find recordings of him in in performance there, sure. were, there were only a few that you could purchase and i have multiple copies of of several performances just because i have you know like the bot the whole box set and i have then little right. separate uh, dvds that i collected along the way but luckily nowadays you can find almost all of it on online you can find it on youtube or or whatever um, so it's really easy uh, to, to, to find him and, and watch him. And of course, he, he's been passed away now for 16 years, but sure. uh, he just really is, is uh, the, a, a really perfect marriage, I think, of being in the moment, like you're saying, but also being really ideal. He's like I, an idealist and a pragmatist, and he goes back and forth really quickly, which I think I, the perfect conductor does. Um, so you're, you're trying to you're trying to model the ideal sound. Here's how we should sound like in this section. Here's how that quarter note should sound. Here's that how that staccato sixteenth note should sound on the on the very highest tessitura in the piccolo. Um, but when all of a sudden you, that meets with reality, and maybe it's not the way that you idealize it, you've got to be able to to switch the light and all of a sudden go into a mode that is helping enable the sound that you're trying to go after. So that that's a that that example you're talking about, Carlos Kleiber, right. is a great one in that you know he he's just really enjoying the sound and is listening to it, but something all of a sudden breaks from his ideal, and he's able to pinpoint number one when it happens, where it happens. He knows it's that one trumpet player, and then he he's persistent. He sticks with that trumpet player to keep trying to show them how he idealized that sound, and until they get to a point of compromise. Maybe, maybe it's not exactly how he wants it, but it's, it's, it's good enough, or maybe it's great for the player. And, and uh, it introduces an idea that the conductor never even thought about. Um, so there's, there, there's, there's room that you create that's open enough that it's not just your ideal. It's maybe being open to a plurality of ideals, but once you achieve that moment, then, okay, now we can let go. And now we can go on to the next ideal moment or the next, next real moment, the next pragmatic moment that you have to address. Um, but Carlos Kleiber is amazing. And, and I, I totally avoided your question, but there's, yeah, there's a lot <laughs> of really fun. great conductors. Um, another one that I, I really enjoy it, And again, so uh, I'll start with the ones who are no longer on this earth. Sure. Uh, Sergio uh, Cella oh, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. uh, it, it's is It's C E L I. B I D A C H E H E, right? Yeah. yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh and and he is a I think a really interesting conductor to watch. Um uh especially in rehearsal. I, I think there's some really interesting rehearsal elements that you can learn from watching Cella Badaka. Um li living conductors, one my, my probably my favorite living orchestral conductor right now is Esapeka Salonen. Uh I think he's just a visionary. Um, on a lot of lot of ways, I mean, both with pro, with programming, with the use of technology, with mm -hmm. the use of uh, of virtual uh, learning and virtual teaching, but um, but but especially in his the way that he rehearses and conducts, uh, I just I really it, that's someone who really inspires me. And he he was just named music director of the San Francisco Symphony um, after taking a few years off. He's a composer as well as conductor. Um, and I, and I, I really appreciate his conducting, um, in the, uh, in the wind band world. I mean, we have a lot of great examples as well. Um, Bob Reynolds is probably, uh, right. sort of at the top of everybody's list. H Robert Reynolds, uh, as a, as a real shining exemplar of, of what we can do. And, um, and, and as someone who has had a really huge impact on a lot of us because of the, uh, 
the longevity of his teaching. So he's been teaching since the late sixties uh, and has had, so since the late sixties, you know, over 50 years of conducting students right. who have gone out into the world and have, have in turn taught their students. And in some, in some regards, uh, like in, in the case of my teacher and colleague, Eugene Corporan has taught students, uh, has taught children of students. <laughs> so he's taught multiple generations in the same family of conductors. Um, but it really kind of traces back to uh, H. Robert Reynolds. And so he, he's a, a great conductor to watch in rehearsal and in performance. And uh, what I love about Bob Reynolds is also how he is a, a constant learner. So you can still go into the instrumentalist every once in a while and read an article by Bob Reynolds of him observing another conductor in rehearsal and performance. Uh, most recently, I think he, he wrote an article on, on Andrus Nelson's, who's uh, the music director at Boston and Gavon House. And, um, and it's, you know, Bob Reynolds, who we, we all should be writing articles about watching Bob Reynolds in <laughs> rehearsal and, and right. a lot of us do and have, but Bob Reynolds in turn also is watching other conductors and learning from them. So I, I you know, I think it's probably because of the nature of conducting that the fact that it's such a visual nonverbal art form that um, I, I, I really learned so much from watching other conductors work. And probably as, as often uh, as I find inspiration uh, watching conductors that I want to emulate, I also find inspiration watching conductors that I, I, I wouldn't choose to emulate, you know, or, or, I, or do things in a way that I wouldn't necessarily do them. But uh, now in, I would say early on in my career, I would, if I watch somebody that I wouldn't necessarily align with philosophically, I would just assume that, okay, that's not for me. And, that, and that's, I, or, or I would make a, uh, a value judgment on, on them as a musician or a conductor. Uh, and, I, and that was really unfortunate on my part because since sure. then I really learned, um, I, I feel like um, I'm able to watch somebody that maybe I wouldn't want to conduct like because that's not me. That's not how my body works and that's not how I naturally move. But, um, but I can really learn a lot from what it is that they're trying to achieve, especially musically and in rehearsal. So I, you know, I, I've gone to open rehearsals of, um, of orchestras, of wind bands. I, I was the person when I was teaching public school, um, if we hosted a, if we had a district honor band or we had a, a state or a university honor band, uh, I, I, as much as I could, I would be in the rehearsal watching. Um, and that's oftentimes... That's a, that's a really great opportunity for our colleagues to get together and just kind of have a support system. Like, you know, they'll, they'll, uh, what I would find, and I, what I find when I go and conduct honor bands now is oftentimes, you know, if you need to find a band director, the band room is not the place to go. Now, I understand <laughs> that's where they are all the time. Right. So they, and they don't have a chance to see their colleagues. So when, when they get together, they, they, you know, they'll go to the, the, li the music library, or they'll go into the, um, the teacher's lounge and then, and they'll talk all about the profession and, and about their personal lives. And they'll, they'll make connections, which is really important. Um, but at the same time, whenever I was in that situation, I would try to make sure that I was in that rehearsal room watching a, a conductor. Cause I, I was just trying, I was so hungry to learn. So even now, if I go to, uh, to a state convention, TMEA, uh, or the Midwest clinic, I try to slip into rehearsals as much as I can, especially if it's a, if it's a conductor who uh, has had some, some level of success on whatever level they teach on. Um, I, I want to try to figure out, you know, what, why, why, why do they have that success? <laughs> what, what got them there? Right. And, and there's, there's always a reason. So it's always really kind of fun to go in and sort of cipher that out and figure out what, uh, what it is that I can learn from that ex experience. You know, and with with watching conductors, you know, via rehearsal and via performance, it's it's definitely different. And you know, whether you're watching videos of different conductors or watching it live in time in the rehearsal aspect, you see very very different approaches. You know, to the the verbal communication when you know the sound stops and they want to give uh, insight to what they heard. You mm -hmm. might hear a conductor talk for minutes at a time. Mm -hmm. say this is the desired sound I'm going for and then there's other schools of thought of you know seven words or less um it, do you find yourself in I don't know maybe again it depends on the situation do you ever find yourself I'm more of the I want to show them the sound or I've seen people say I want it to look like this and you know they do their gesture however it may be or is it more of a 
uh, let's sit down, talk shop, figure it out, and then we'll try it again. How do you, how do you approach that? For, uh, yeah. For well, um, here, so here's, here's an ideal and then the <laughs> pragmatic. So <laughs> sure. I think the ideal is that, is that we, we try to, we try to show, we, uh, we try to show more than we, than we, we talk. I think that's just sort of the ideal that most of us sort of hold up. Uh, and it's not always necessarily what we demonstrate. And I, and I know that I'm guilty as, as anybody of telling my students, no, 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 stop talking and just conduct. And then I'll catch myself on the podium. Like, Oh, I'm, well, I'm going, I'm, I'm in jabbing. paragraph number two. <laughs> what is, what, you know, why am I doing this? I think why that's important is because, well, two, two things, but they, they both have to do with, the fact that uh, music is a doing, right? It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's an experiential in the moment activity. And so our, you know, we, we call our students who make music players, right? I mean, they, they come in the door and they want to play. They want to play music. Right. Uh, when, we're, when we're performing a piece, we're playing the piece. So th that is, I think, the ideal mode is if it, the, the best way to learn music is by doing music, right? And anytime that we um, stop and try to teach them in a mode that isn't music making, we're even even if it's effective, we're we're a little bit removed from the actual activity. So and and to be honest, even if we're conducting, that's a little bit removed from the actual making of sound, right? Because as a as right. conductor, when we're conducting, the idea is that we don't make sound. Um, so so that's a little bit removed. Even further removed is talking about it, because. What, what usually is happening is that as we, as we conductors talk about the music, the players aren't making music. They have their instrument in their laps, right? Or they're, uh, even if they're writing something in and they're, they're, you know, they're really taking great notes and they're really absorbing it and then figuring out ways to apply it. Um, I mean, they're, they're, I'm not saying that's not important, but it's not as close to sort of a perfect zero sum game of learning while doing. So what uh, nonverbal communication uh, in other words, not talking while we conduct enables the players to do is make adjustments in, in real time as they're making sound. What that's doing is as they hear the sound change, as they feel what it is that they're doing to change, whether it's an embouchure thing or it's a fingering thing, or it's just uh, a, a, an air stream thing, or it's something that they're adjusting musically that since they're in the moment, they're, ma they're con making connections in the synaptic connections in their brain that is, that's more authentic and, and um, most efficient compared to when we stop and break things down. Now, that's not to say that sometimes the most efficient thing in the moment is to stop and address something, right. you know? Um, it, so so there, there's definitely times where it just, it's just more quick just to say, no, 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 stop, stop, stop. Measure 25. Here we go, you know, and then, and then get them in that way rather than like, you know, oh, okay, I know it's crashing and burning, but let's just go ahead and let's see if we can make it through this. Right. And shouting out instructions over the top of them <laughs> playing or trying to show, I mean, sometimes you just need to stop. Yeah, and, and absolutely. Just address, you know, what's going on. And, and uh, sometimes that's just the most efficient way. But in terms of the most ideal way, it would be to, uh, to try to influence the sound while it's happening. And especially with wind instruments that are that are generally louder than um, our other modes of making music, uh, either vocally or or through string music, wind music is, in, as we all know, is generally loud, louder. So in terms of talking over them while they're playing, even if they could hear us, there's still going to be a little delay of application. Okay, I'm playing that B flat on my trumpet, and conductor is saying something, and now I need to adjust. Oh, and now I'm on the on the D. You know, right. you've already moved on. So as much as we can, that's, that's I think, why conducting has really kind of uh, has, has become a mode of influencing sound, especially in the last 200 years, say, is that um, it allows the players to be in the moment. And of course, when you're in a performance, right? I mean, ideally, you don't start and stop because there's <laughs> yeah. issues. You're able right. to address things. And by issues, I mean, it could be just simply like, we just, I just want to crescendo more here. Don't we all, what if we all crescendoed more than we've ever crescendoed before or day crescendoed more than we've ever day crescendoed before? Or what if we slowed that phrase down more than we've ever done in, in a rehearsal, but boy, it feels like we should right now. Then we're able to do that without sort of stopping and going, okay, 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 okay. Uh, hold on just a second. We turn around talk to the audience. We're going to, we're going to try that again. Uh, we're going to go back to 45 and we're going to, you know, just in, in right. the moment is more uh, authentic and, and efficient. So 
you know, I, I would say, yes, uh, we probably all talk too much. Uh, but sometimes you just have to. But, sure. but yeah, I, I, more ideally, trying to, to show things through gesture rather than, uh, and in the moment, rather than stopping going out of the moment and trying to address something that's not happening at that moment. Right. I think there's definitely been times, you know, if I've been on the podium in front of my kids where maybe it was just the rehearsal overall was a little stagnant and we just kind of like, like I put the baton down and then you're like, all right, let's just talk for a second. And I think that those moments have been really, really effective. And, you know, and then the next, you know, the next take you do is outstanding. Some of the best playing they maybe have ever done. Or, but sometimes I've, again, like you said, the more you keep them playing, especially being, you know, a director of like a beginning band or entry level choir, like those kids are there. They want to play. They want to, mm -hmm. they want to make sound. So if you go on this, long drawn out talk with a, a little sixth grader who's holding this you know thousand dollar instrument in their hands something's gonna happen whether it's good or bad in that moment but chances are you know they they want to play and i think that was highlighted very 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 well in uh in what you just said with us and yeah i one, one thing you said just sparked my my thought uh there, there's Something we, we do a lot of recording projects at, at North Texas, but um, but you 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 participated in several uh, at Ohio University too. Yeah. Uh, in in uh, this is not my original thought, but but one one thing we notice is that um, if if we're having a hard time recording a certain passage with an ensemble, uh, in, you know, and you're an hour twenty of recording, you know, right. of that day, <laughs> and and you know everyone's tense and tired and mentally everyone's drained. Um, sometimes the way to get, if you, if you can't get that take to get better, sometimes the best way is just, is just to stop and sort of recharge and, uh, and, and tell a story or do something that's completely unrelated right. to the passage and then to go back and play it. What we find is that almost always the best takes are after there's been laughter and, and sometimes it's laughter at, at ourselves. Sometimes it's just general laughter, but, but if there's some sort of joy in the room, and it sort of relaxes everybody, and almost everybody is better when they're they're more comfortable, right? There's right. sort of an old model of like you know like uh, you you perform better under pressure, and so I'm gonna yell <laughs> at you and scream at you, and um, the, the the after the I've screamed at you the loudest, then you're gonna play it the best, and that's extrinsic motivation, right? That's fear, right? Um, but when people are just sort of relaxed, they tend to we find they, they tend to perform better. So that, that's a really uh, great example that you gave of like, like sometimes just stopping and let, let's just talk through. Um, I think that why that's effective is because it's, it's a change in the mode of learning, right? I mean, it's, right. Uh, it, 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 it is helpful to take breaks and it's helpful to sort of spell the instruction. So it's not sort of so repetitive and so redundant that, um, that it's ineffective. So yeah, that's a great point. No, I think that's, it's completely valid. And this is, I think this is a perfect segue. You know, we're talking about conducting and getting better as conductors. Um, University of North Texas is hosting a conducting collegium in, mm -hmm. and when does that take place, Dr. Traxel? Uh, it's well, now I can say it's next month because now since it's May 1st, so <laughs> we made it to uh, May, yeah. <laughs> whenever this is broadcast, it, it, it's in June. So it's June 8th through 19th. June. And, um, and that is a, is, is a, is, is when it was originally scheduled pre-COVID, we, we were going to have a, we were going to start our collegium back up again. Um, the, the conductor's collegium traditionally is in person, of course, because one of the one of the the most efficient ways to learn conducting is by doing it, just like music. <laughs> so, um, so we have this great collegium where the North Texas Wind Symphony is the ensemble that you that the conductors get to conduct, uh, both in rehearsal and in performance. Uh, it's sort of unique in that it's an actual. Uh, it's a, it's a, it's an actual ensemble. All ensembles are actual or real, but, but it's, it's, it's the actual uh, personnel from the North Texas Wind Symphony. And, um, and what another, the other aspect that makes it unique is that there's actual concerts. So the, the participants who are conducting actually perform in, in a real concert um, in the evenings. So it's, it's kind of what makes our collegium unique, but of course, uh, COVID. Yeah, so we, um, we've sort of reimagined our collegium so that it's 100% online, which I, you know, 100% online and conducting, I think are things that hardly ever are sort of imagined together and are certainly not 100% the ideal either. You know, we recognize that the in-person collegium is, is perhaps the most effective way to, to improve, 
Um, but given the circumstances that we have and given, given the challenge that we really wanted to make sure that our students, whether they're university students or they're um, workshop participants from around the world, we wanted to give them an opportunity to learn in the summer, particularly this summer, where we've all been shut in for, for weeks. And by June, it could be, it could be dozens of weeks. Um, sure. And we've, we've all lost a lot of opportunities to make music together. Um, and so we want to we let people have an opportunity to somehow connect, make music, and, and continue to grow because we know people are hungry for that. We're hungry for that. We, and we're hungry to teach and we're hungry to, to learn from other people. And so we've got all these really great guest lectures that are coming in from Leonard Slatkin to H. Robert Reynolds, who I mentioned before, to Frank Battisti, to Mallory Thompson, uh, to um, Jerry McCoy, who is a formal choral conductor, to Alec Harris, who's the president of GIA Publications, to Barry Green, who's a bassist and writer of the Inner Game of Music. Um, I mean, just it's we're gonna we're gonna learn. The, the Collegium <laughs> faculty members are gonna learn so much from from these people. Uh, we're just so excited to be able to do it and and to offer something. That's it's so important to us. Well, I think just you know you guys have it broken up to where there are people that are wanting to conduct or still getting the opportunity to conduct, mm -hmm. and you have it uh, also set up to where it's more kind of lecture based and more conversational. And mm -hmm. I think you can gain so much about just talking shop, you know, and just you know sprouting ideas off of one another. Um, and, and I, all of those conductors, you know, whether you've watched a master class of them online or you've seen them in the moment actually doing it, you're gaining so much out of it. Um, I will never forget one of the most um, musical moments that has ever happened in my life was I was able to perform at uh, International Trumpet Guild in 2015 when it was in mm -hmm. Ohio. And they hosted one of the premier groups was the uh, Monarch Brass, which is an oh, yeah. all-female brass group. And many uh, members of the Marine Band are in that group as well. And Mallory Thompson came to conduct mm -hmm. it. And this was straight performance. And I I've never been so moved by music. And of course, they did Posey. They did uh, Mind and Mysterium. Just all of this beautiful work. Um, I and one of my buddies, Josh Barringer, was <laughs> sitting next to me. And he's like, I've been crying the whole time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. and you know and it was great to see stuff like that but i also i was so moved by that that i i went on this mallory thompson rabbit hole of you know looking at what was online of mallory's because i was so moved at what she did on the podium in front of this group and i got so much out of just online videos of just watching her work and do her craft so well right um so the fact that you're still getting it live in the moment, it might be through a screen. I think people are going to gain so, so much out of what you guys are offering for them. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we hope so. And I, and I, and I think, I think I, we're the litmus test. We, we, we think we're going to get a lot out of it ourselves personally. <laughs> yeah, right. And, uh, if, and if everybody else feels, you know, e even a, a small iota of the excitement that we feel about being able to offer this, um, I, I think it's going to be really special. And, um, you know, what, what's, uh, we kind of, we, the other thing that we love about it is just the fact that, um, you know, you from like, like we're doing now, you can do it from your house. You don't have to worry about right. how do I get down to Texas? How do I, um, how do I, you know, secure housing for two? The other thing is our, ours is a long workshop. It's 12 days, two weeks. Right. So housing is an expense that people have to consider food you know the food is amazing but you have you know you have to eat <laughs> so uh so that you know you can make a peanut butter sandwich after listening to frank batisti and then you can work with eugene corporon on conducting i mean like you know you can eat in the comfort of your food. own home <laughs> right it's you know so it's uh it's really it's really kind of amazing and i think it's something that we'll, we'll see it may it may influence the way that we do the collegium in the future in that we may still have the in-person component but also allow subscribers to come in and, and sit in on the lectures because right. uh, if it works this summer, there's no reason why it wouldn't work in the future. And someone may want to just come in and watch one lecture. They may want to come in and just sit in on the lectures for those two weeks, but then in the afternoon, they've got to go work um, their drum line, you know, at their, at their right. school. And it enables people to sort of do that. So we're, we're seeing, I mean, we're, we're getting, I think far more people participating on whatever level, because because you can do just the morning, you can do just the afternoon. Uh, the mornings are the lectures, the afternoons are is the conducting coaching. Um, you can do both, um, but we're we're getting I think more people participating than we would in in a in a live year, an in person year, uh, which is really exciting. And and people from all over the world. I mean, you know, from from uh, from Asia and from 
um, from Canada and, you know, just from all over the United States, of course, too. So um, it's and Europe. And so it's, it's exciting. Yeah, that's super awesome. I know uh, I was super excited. I was looking at um, some actual stats for this podcast and we, we made it to Europe and Asia already, which wow. I was like, whoa, wow. we've, we're, we're three episodes in. This is exciting. And hopefully those <laughs> people listen to this and tune into that even more. Um, and this a perfect segue um, talking about all of these cool global projects that you are doing with uh, Lone Star Youth, or- uh, Youth Winds and uh, Wind Orchestra. Mm-hmm. Um, I was, you know, fortunate to listen to, uh, you guys did Amazing Grace, uh, Frank to Kelly's arrangement of that. And, uh, you did, uh, Sacred Spaces by John Mackey. That's probably one of my like top 10 favorite pieces. I, I really mm-hmm. enjoy that. And the first off the caliber of these, you know, recordings are sensational. They're fantastic. And it's, I think it's just a great way to show unity and show that even though we're far apart, there's really cool opportunities to play. Um, and create some sort of togetherness out of all of this. Mm-hmm. And you guys are working on another project, which I'm super stoked about with uh, Julie Giroux. Could you talk mm-hmm. about that a little bit and kind of what's what the world could look forward to in these next few sure. years? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so yeah, so the, just the uh, <clears throat> what, what you hit on is exactly the whole reason behind these, these videos uh, <clears throat> is, is Lone Star Wind Orchestra, which is um, it's, it's a really amazing organization and it, and it is an organization. It's a team of people. Uh, we've got people who are on the creative team and the artistic team, the marketing team and the, the, the board of directors. Um, pretty, pretty quickly in, in this period of time, these, I call these extraordinary times that we're living in. Uh, there, there, was, there was this identification by the board members and the creative team that um, there's, there's got to be some way that we can figure out how to connect people. Uh, and and one, one of the mantras of Lone Star Wind Orchestra is music changing lives. And so the, the board felt really strongly that if there's a way to reach out to other musicians and help them connect, uh, and if, if we're able to do that, then we're fulfilling that mission. We're trying to change lives through music. So uh, really early on, I, this was, uh, this seems so long ago now, but it was, it was late March. It was like March 22nd or 21st, I think, because this was even before we started up virtual classes again at, at UNT. But anyway, it was, um, we, we had a conversation on a Saturday night. There was, there was a whole team of us that met through, uh, through video conferencing and uh, just sort of became the spark of the idea of how, how to do a project like this. And we had different people who, uh, some people who have been doing these kind of projects for 10 years uh, and, and are really sort of the innovators and the, the, the people who un- really understand how to make it work successfully. Um, through trial, trial and error over the last decade. <laughs> right. So we had those people in on the call. We had, you know, marketing people. We had all sorts of people in on, on this conference call. And within, I don't know, a couple of days, all of a sudden this thing was launched and we were, we were going full steam ahead. And really it's not let up. It's like every day, every day there's dozens of emails of communication between all the team members trying to figure out how to, how to keep moving forward. Um, anyway, one of, one of the outgrowths of that project was, or out, out of that meeting was, Let's do, let's do these projects for the, the personnel, the, the current members of these ensembles, Lone Star Wind Orchestra, Lone Star Youth Winds, which is a, the, the Wind Orchestra is the professional adult group. The Wind mm-hmm. Youth Winds is um, high school students. Um, it was a way, let's, let's help them connect, first of all. Then, once we figure out how to do that, let's invite the world to join us. So um, I think today, I think today being May 1st, I think today, uh, or shortly thereafter will be, will be the release of the first global ensemble video, uh, which is John Phillips' um, Stars and Stripes Forever. John Phillips Souza's, sorry, <laughs> Stars and Stripes Forever. Uh, we'll allow all three names there. Yeah, um, perfect. <clears throat> which is, uh, is, is the Lone Star Wind Orchestra is the core and musicians from all over the world joining in. Um, and, and, you know, it, it's open submission. So it's whatever, whoever, wherever they are, um, you know, whatever country they're in, they can submit. And we've, uh, it was really amazing to see all the countries that, that participated, um, hundreds of players from all over the world, uh, in, at al- in almost every continent, save Antarctica, uh, participated in the project. So that's really, really cool. And the, and the product should be out pretty soon. Um, but, but the other side of it, Lone Star Youth Wins, the idea was, okay, let's, we, we also want to do the same thing with them. We want to, we want to create a global ensemble and with, with the primary focus being, but not, not 
uh, exclusively young young musicians. So so sure. high school students. The, the, all of our students who are uh, have found themselves the same way that we do um, at, at their homes um, without the the connections that we can make uh, normally through in person experiential band rehearsal and performance. So we wanted to develop that as well. And and this was still that first meeting. Um, immediately after getting off the the call, I was trying to run through my head, what would be the ideal piece for that? For the wind orchestra, it was uh, Stars and Stripes Forever. I thought, okay, what is the piece that can really sort of bring us together? And immediately, um, almost immediately anyway, I thought, of, I thought about, well, maybe we, ha we could have a composer write something that would um, also be like another po point of interest for the project. So sure. uh, I thought, okay, what, what composer can do this in a relatively short amount of time and it be a, a great piece, not just for the project, but for a piece that would hopefully live on. You know, the idea is that it hopefully it would be a piece that wouldn't just be, okay, this was just for this little project from, you know, April 22nd to May 4th, but rather this was something that could live on and, and sort of uh, be associated with the project, but have its, have its own life. And, and the composer that immediately came to mind, and I really, uh, I didn't need to think about any other composer was Julie Giroux. Uh, and, and the reason why Julie's perfect for it, I felt, um, and, and I'm not so sure, sure that she felt that along the process, <laughs> but, but, but she persevered and uh, came up with a really incredible piece. Um, but Julie writes um, not only for wind band music, that's how a lot of us know her, but she's also a film and television composer uh, and also writes music for like, uh, the the Oscars, you know, uh, all right. the music that you hear in between, all the arrangements and things, uh, she's written for that. And so she's she's someone who knows how to how to produce qual high quality music in a relatively short amount of time. Much, I mean, I would like still be learning how to open up a document in finale, <laughs> yeah, and she right. she'll have written a piece, you know. So I I I I reached out to her that night, that same night. I texted her. And I said, Julie, um, I've got this this really crazy project that's that we're trying to figure it out with Lone Star. And she was familiar with Lone Star because she had been a guest com composer and conductor with the Youth Winds just last spring before I came back to the area. Um, and so she was familiar with the, with the group and was kind of knew what we were about. And I said, well, what we want to do is this. And I explained the project to her. And I said, I, you know, the, the, the hard part about it is, is we want to roll this out kind of quickly. And I, I just, I don't know if this is even crazy to ask you. Well, she came back with, well, when do you need it? And I thought, okay, well, here's where I lose her. And I'm like, yeah. uh, I don't know, like in a week or two weeks or maybe three. And she wrote back right away. I mean, almost right away. She said, well, I'll have it done by Friday. You know, so this was a Saturday. And she was saying, I'll, I'll, I won't start on, on it until Monday. Give me, give me a day off. And then I'll, I'll have it done by Friday. And so I was like, okay, all right. So she, I mean, she, I, mean I knew she could do it, but right. it's just a choice of whether she, she uh, had the time to do it at, at that moment. Um, and so she wrote this really great piece and, um, and her story about it is really interesting. And I know she'll share more about it down the road. And in fact, we have a video out now with the, with the youth winds about her talking about the piece a little bit, but her inspiration was from a trip she took to Ireland just about a year ago, uh, back when, you know, traveling internationally was a thing that um, was normal. You know, we all, we all <laughs> wanted to do, but we all did on a, on a much more regular basis than right. now. Uh, but she was so inspired by, well, she had written actually a couple other pieces first to, for this project, or she had gotten deep into projects of, of pieces that she thought were going to be the ones. And she just kept hitting roadblocks. It's like we all been experiencing. I, I have to admit naively that at the beginning of this whole thing, I thought, Oh my gosh, I'm going to get so much done. I'm going to, I'm going <laughs> to write a book. I'm going to, you know, right. I've got to edit the new teaching music volume, I, I, which I have to do and I'm, I'm doing, but uh, I'm going to, I'm going to do this. I'm going to do that. I'm going to get all these things accomplished. Uh, and, and our reality is that, um, you know, it, it's life is a little bit, maybe much more hectic than it was when we were just on a regular schedule. Absolutely. So, and of course there's so many other things that are going on, our health and our safety of our, of us and our loved ones and our students, um, that <clears throat> Julie ran into some of the same issues. And so some of the things that she started writing just didn't, she would wake up the next morning and realize that's not the right piece. So she finally settled on sort of what she says, like, I wanted to go, I sort of had to take myself out of the present time and go back in time to a time that was happier when I was in Ireland um, with loved ones 
and meeting all these new people and having this great trip and connecting with musicians. And so that's where she went mentally. And then, uh, so this piece, River Shannon, is, is about the River Shannon that's in Ireland. It's the, it's the, I guess the, it's the biggest river in Ireland, uh, one of the, the, the main rivers. And, um, and it definitely has sort of an Irish or Celtic uh, flavor to it, a la, um, you know, like Irish tune from County Dairy or, or in, any number of, of pieces that sort of have Irish influences. So, um, so she, she wrote it for us pretty quickly. Uh, she, she got it to us and we've been able to then put it on our website. So currently, I don't know when this broadcast, but currently it's out and available. Um, and we, we just extended the deadline slightly to, um, to May 6th. So Wednesday, May 6th, 11.59 Central Time PM, you can, you can still uh, submit to the, the, the project. And so far we've had, uh, as of yesterday morning, uh, the project had only been open less than a week and there was already... Uh, five or 600 downloads from around the world wow. from people who had downloaded it. Not that they had yet recorded and submitted it, but, sure. but at least people who had been interested in the project. So we hope to keep growing it. We've got a good partnership with Bands of Ireland, which is a, a, a really great connection of, of conductors and musicians from Ireland who um, are you know going through the same things we all are, trying to figure out ways to right. connect. And, and they're doing it really successfully. And they're, they're in on it. And, and they're actually... Part of part of the influence that that Julie had in writing the piece as well um, is is there the impact and the people that she met through her trip to Ireland last year. So um, so th what's really cool in summary, because as a conductor now I'm talking too much, but in summary, <laughs> it's the opportunity. It's truly a world premiere because we're, we're premiering a piece that's never been played before. Right. But it's also a premiere with the world. So it's with players from all over the world, Thailand, uh, Australia, Europe, Ireland, including Ireland, uh, the United States, Canada, um, South America. And uh, it, so it, it's, it's a world premiere on many levels. And so we're really excited about it. And then, um, but, you know, I, I wish I could take credit for all the, all the amazing post-production that happens to make these videos possible, but we're fortunate in that we have these great audio engineers and video engineers that have been working on, on these things. Um, just tirelessly to put it together. Cause as you can imagine, it's a giant jigsaw puzzle. Oh yeah. <laughs> you know, there's, we certainly have a process and, and it makes things easier. It doesn't make things easy, but it makes it easier. Right. Um, and that, uh, and, and we're fortunate we have those people. Cause if, if, again, if I was doing it, I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't have even downloaded the software yet uh, <laughs> yeah. or, and, and successfully opened it. So these people, you know, we have experts working on that, that, that side of things. Well, the thing that I like about it, you know, and just like you said, these these virtual ensembles, as beautiful and as awesome as they are, it is, you know, it's definitely a task to put them together. Right. And, you know, and I know our our fellow educators, you know, whether you're doing middle school, high school, it, it can be a lot. And I know you might be pressured to do one of these ensembles, but I think this is a great opportunity for even students who may not have the resources through their district to record and do a virtual ensemble, this gives them that opportunity. Like if you have a phone or something that you can record yourself, you know, with some sort of video quality and submit, you have that opportunity to perform with others, which I think is really cool that you guys have taken the time to put a team together and you have all of these great resources that you can, you know, lend a helping hand to somebody who may not have that option. That, that's, that's right. And, and, and we, we are the first to recognize, because I, I just answered an email yesterday from a, a school district in, in Texas uh, asking about like, how, how, how are you doing that? And how, how can we do it? And um, I, I just, I wanted to make sure that I was really upfront first and say, well, listen, um, we, by all means, do, do your project. Um, but I, I don't want you to misunderstand. It's, it's not easy. <laughs> and it's yeah, not right. just, you know, it's not me or Eugene Corporon going in and editing all these files and putting them together. I mean, right. we, we, we did the connecting videos. And then for the most part, uh, we have a little bit of input, but for the most part, we let the experts do what they're supposed to do. Um, so, so the, the the global ensemble is an opportunity, just like you're saying, for for um, for anyone who's listening, your students to to take part in a project like this, where it doesn't where it means that you're not going to have to spend 40 hours in post production, you know, <laughs> getting frustrated with yourself right. and, and with everybody trying to put it together. So, um, yeah, we we hope, and and honestly, we hope. Uh, from the onset, the, the idea was that we, if we developed a process that was really good and efficient and, um, and possible, that we would, we would then share the process with anybody who was interested. Um, so that was, that was really, you know, if we wanted these things to live on, it wasn't just so that we could finish 
the project. It was to figure out a process that we could share with people so that if they had the wherewithal and the time that they could also do it uh, with their own students in their own programs um, and produce their own. And, and you know, you're, we're, we're certainly not alone. You're seeing a lot of people putting these projects together. <clears throat> but I think where we're, we're maybe a little unique is that we're, we're inviting everybody to join us sure. uh, rather than just, um, um, just contain it, which also makes it a little bit more difficult because now you've got 400, 500 people that are joining in, <laughs> right. which is amazing, but necessarily uh, exponentially complicates things. But it's yeah. a good complication. Yeah, it's it's like a great problem to have, right? <laughs> you know, right. who you know, who is to be shamed for wanting to make music? You know, <laughs> right? <laughs> no. Well, I think um, if you are at all interested in either of these events, whether it's the Collegium or uh, this global ensemble, this uh, video is actually, or this episode rather, is going to be early posted because I think it's a great opportunity for, so this will actually be posted Saturday, May 2nd. So that great. gives you a little bit ahead. Usually I post on Sundays, but I think this is too good to pass up. Um, so I will be editing and cleaning up stuff and making sure that this is out for everybody uh, with the links attached to not only the Collegium, uh, but the opportunity for the global ensemble as well, because it's too cool to not do. Um, <laughs> and uh, I think it's just a tremendous opportunity. And I love, um, you know, I was just doing some research and looking at, you know, the Lone Star Wind Orchestra website and things. And one of the missions of it was, you know, to make the best music possible with whatever, you know, instrumentalist you have in front of you. And I think you are definitely taking on that challenge and task, um, not only making good music, but making good music virtually. <laughs> and uh, I think you guys have done a really tremendous job of, you know, showing collaboration and unity in, in these crazy times. So thank you. <laughs> Thank, well, thank you, and thanks to everyone who, who uh, you know, takes a chance and, and participates. We, we hope everybody who wants to do it can do it. Awesome. Well, you heard it from Dr. Andrew Traxel. It has been a great privilege to have him. Thank you all so much for tuning in, and we will see you next time on Music Ed All In. Take it easy, everybody. Thank you. Hey, guys, thanks again so much for listening. If you liked this video, please feel free to subscribe. If you're more of a visual person, feel free to subscribe right on YouTube. If you're more of just wanting an audio, if you're that person that likes to ride in their car, be sure to check out Budsprout, iTunes, and Spotify. If you'd like to email, feel free to email musiced.allin at gmail.com. Don't forget to like the Music Ed all in Facebook page for updates, trailers, and more. Take it easy, gang, and always go all in.